Hello, and welcome to Chagask Research Insights. My name is Paul Crossan, and I am Beef Enterprise Leader with Chagask. Research Insights is a series of webinars focused on the latest thinking and research from Chagask and how this is addressing the challenges and opportunities in the agri-food sector. These are a series of one-hour webinars with Chagask researchers, and it's aimed at anyone interested in our research. So that includes professionals in the agri-food sector, other researchers, media, farmers, uh, and indeed policy makers. In this series, we are focused on a wide range of issues, including soils and the environment, food, viruses, grass and management, and the most recent webinar looked at animal welfare two weeks ago. The webinars are all recorded, so if you would like to watch them back, they're all available on the Chagas website. Today is the 20th webinar in the series, and the focus is moving to antibiotic and antimintic resistance in farm animals. We're all now much more aware of the importance of this issue and of increasing antimicrobial resistance in animals and indeed in humans, and therefore prudent use at farm level is absolutely essential. Over the next hour, we have three excellent speakers who will discuss different aspects of this issue. Firstly, Edgar Garcia Manzanilla will look at steps we can take to reduce antimicrobial resistance. We'll, we'll then have Orla Keane, who will move the focus to antiparasitic resistance. And finally, Neil Field will look at clinical aspects of antimicrobial and antiparasitic resistance. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and those of you who are familiar with that uh, know what to do. You, you submit your questions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for anyone who's new to this, there is a Q&A function. Uh, in order to submit the question, please include the name of the presenter to whom the question has been addressed and your question. It should be noted that we typically have many questions and we don't have time to answer them all, so any questions which are not addressed during the course of the webinar will be made available afterwards, uh, the answers will be made available afterwards on the Research Insights webpage of the Chavez website. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Edgar. Edgar, if you can share your screen, please. Um, Edgar is going to look at aspects of antimicrobial resistance uh, Edgar is the head of the pig development unit uh, in Chagas uh, and is based at Moorpark. Uh, so, Edgar, please. Thank you for that, Paul. So, as Paul said, today we're going to be talking about the different aspects of antimicrobial resistance. In my case, I'm going to be talking mainly about the use of, of antibiotics and the importance of the use and the consequences. So, uh, So most of the people in the audience probably have seen uh, headings like this, like the importance of the antibiotics, the problem that we will have in the future, how many antibiotics are used in, in animal production or in human medicine, or, or the, the, when you go to the supermarket, you can see this kind of labeling, antibiotic free and things like that. But uh, in, in many cases, it's not, not clear what they refer to and what is the exact problem. So the, the objective with this talk will be that we clarify a little bit this. The contents of the, of the talk is going to be first addressing what is antimicrobial resistance, then uh, where is exactly the problem and how bad it is, because we see all these uh, headings, but we don't really know how bad it is. And then uh, where is the, that we are using the antimicrobials because that guides us a little bit to where we can actually do changes. And then finally, uh, what changes or what can we do to, to decrease the use of the, of the antimicrobials and then the, reduce the antimicrobial resistance problem. So first, uh, antimicrobial resistance is, is the ability that bacteria or viruses or any microorganisms have to survive in the presence of, of an antimicrobial, like for example, an antibiotic or antiparasitic that Orla will talk about, when you use it uh, in a way that normally will kill them. So the bacteria in this case, for example, become resistant to something that normally would kill them. So this, this ability of bacteria to, to avoid the, the effect of the antibiotics is not something that is new, it's something that is natural for, for bacteria. And this has been like the late, the earliest that this has been observed in, in this paper that you can see here in science that the, in Alaska they did this very big uh, digging in the in in the earth and and they found uh, very very deep in the in the 
geological layers that 30,000 years ago, there were already the same genes that we have now for antimicrobial resistance. So this is not something that is new, it's very old and it's natural for bacteria. The problem that we have is that we, at some point, discover how to use the antibiotics ourselves as humans. And then we say, okay, we can use this to, to cure diseases. And we probably have abused a little bit the use. And at the beginning, you had uh, populations of bacteria where you will have uh, one or two of these in this group that are resistant. And that's not a problem because they, they compete with each other. And there is some that are resistant to this, some to that resistant to that. But when we discover the antibiotics and we start using them, what we are doing is to kill all these bacteria that are not resistant and select for those that are resistant in an unnatural way. So we have all these populations that are fully resistant to the antibiotics. So this selection that we are uh, uh, doing in the bacteria is the, what causes the actual problem. At the same time, uh, selection is not the only problem and bacteria have the ability to transfer uh, genetic material between them. So one bacteria without uh, reproducing, reproduction or anything like that can transfer this piece of DNA to, to another bacteria and that bacteria becomes resistant. So one bacteria can, for example, receive four, five, six of these uh, genes and they can become resistant to, to all these uh, genes. So then the issue that we have is what we see in the slide here. This is a, a COVID patient, for example, and 25% of the COVID patients need antimicrobials because they normally have uh, secondary infections. So this patient, for example, has a, a bacteria that is infecting with the COVID and you run an analysis and the analysis is what you see here on the, on the right. So you test for all these antibiotics, the bacteria that you see, and is resistant to all the antibiotics. And for example, in this one, you are only left with one option to treat the bacteria. So it's colistin that the bacteria is non-resistant, so you can kill the bacteria with that antibiotic. In many cases, you don't even have one. So then you have a problem because you cannot kill the bacteria and the bacteria will certainly kill the, the patient. So that's, that type of bacteria that is multi-resistant to, to many antibiotics is what is called uh, a superbug. So whenever you see that in the news or, or in, in any paper, that's what they are referring to, these bacteria that are able to resist many antibiotics. So where is exactly this problem? Is it in the farms? Is it in the hospital? Is it in the water? Well, it's everywhere. That's the, the only possible answer. So these bacteria, as any other bacteria, they spread everywhere. So people are treated in the hospital and then they take the bacteria home with them. Uh, animals are treated for diseases in farms and then it goes with them or into the into the environment and then in the environment it goes to the rivers to the sewage uh, water treatment plants and things like that then you have wildlife so it's really something that that you cannot tackle in one particular place or with one particular species so uh, there is when when the concept of, of one health is, is introduced and is the tackling this type of issues uh, considering uh, a more holistic approach, considering the animal side of things, the human side of things, and the environmental side of things. In this sense, for example, it's, it's a very clear example because the, the main international organizations for, for health, the World Health Organization, the World Animal Health Organization, and the Food and Agriculture Organization have decided to work together and coordinate the efforts and uh, the World Health Organization has included uh, this issue since 2019 in all the list of, of the 10 most important issues to, to tackle from a health point of view. So this is really a very big problem at the moment in the world. And how bad is it? Uh, for me, it's like comparing when you are run over uh, by a sports car or uh, when you are run over by a, by a very big truck. If you compare, for example, with COVID, with everybody has in, in their minds now, an antibiotic resistance. So when, when you're talking about COVID, it's something that hits you very fast. It's like a sport car. It's coming to you. It's very fast. You are not going to have the opportunity to escape. You know you're going to be hit. But you may be able to jump or do something that avoids the, the car to kill you. You are going to be hit very strongly, but it's what it is. So at the moment we have vaccines and we are able to control the disease in a certain way because it's one virus and we can develop vaccines for viruses, so that's okay. 
In the case of antimicrobial resistance, it's more like a track. It's slower. You see it coming, and we are now seeing it coming. And you say, okay, the track is coming, but I have time to, to escape and the track is not gonna hit me if I move, but you don't know how far you have to move and you get hit. And you know that when you get hit uh, by a car, you are dead. In the case of antimicrobial resistance, it's not one virus, it's bacteria and developing, bacteria, uh, developing vaccines for bacteria is very, very hard. And it's not only one bacteria, it's any bacteria that you have outside there becomes resistant. So there is no option of vaccines or things like that. And lockdown is also not an option because it's gonna spread uh, in a much wider way. So this is the kind of comparison that we are seeing here. In terms of numbers, uh, I put there the number of deaths that we have now total for the total epidemic for COVID. And you see that it is 3.7 million for the whole year and a half that we have been with this. This will be the red line will be the, the level of, of effect that the COVID had in the world. So at the moment, antimicrobial resistance is affecting us with a little bit uh, less than a million. So it will be this um, line here and cancer is affecting us at a much higher level. By 2015, uh, we are expected to have around 8 million cases of cancer a year and antimicrobial resistance which will then pass cancer as the main cause of death and will be 10 million people a year. So when you compare those 10 million people with uh, almost four of COVID, you see the effect that antimicrobial resistance will have. Then uh, it's important to know who is using the antimicrobials to, to try to, to reduce the, the use. And as you can see here, 70% of the antimicrobials are used at the moment in animals and 30% are in humans. That doesn't mean that the antimicrobial resistance is the same proportion in, in animals and, and humans, but that's the consumption that is at, at the moment. And uh, if we go to look at the different types of use of antimicrobials, we don't know, we don't have data because the data is collected in terms of how are you using the antimicrobials, not which, not which species are using the antimicrobials. But we know that uh, there is a, a use in feed, and that's mostly, this is data for Ireland, but it's similar for other countries. So it's mostly in premixes in feed that is used in, in pigs. So that will be one of the main uses, one of the main problems in terms of use. A little bit is used in poultry, but to be, to be fair, poultry have been uh, the best in reducing the antimicrobial use, and at the moment they are very, very low. Then you have another use of antimicrobials in, in animals, that is uh, the use of oral remedies, uh, mostly in water. So that's uh, mainly in Ireland for calves and respiratory disease and all that. And then we have injectables that will be used for all the animals, including dogs and cats. And a little amount here that is in Ireland is quite important because it's used for treatment of mastitis in, in cows. It is a very small amount, but it doesn't mean that it's less important because you could be use, using a, an antibiotic that is very important for humans. And even if it is a small amount, it is uh, very important to reduce it. So the, the total amount is helpful, but it's not the final, the final point here. So what can we do in terms of using antibiotics in a better way and reducing the use? Well, the, the, the main sentence that summarizes the approach is what you have here is as little as possible and as much as necessary. That's the, the rule for use of antimicrobials. But then there is a series of guidelines that are, that are published and that, that we could use to, to guide our, our use of antimicrobials in human medicine or in veterinary medicine or whatever field we are talking about. So here, for example, is a very useful one, which is the six R's, and you have the right uh, diagnostics, the right animal, the right medicine, uh, the right dose of medicine, the right duration of the treatment, and then when you have the leftovers of the drug, the right disposal, because if you throw this into the bin, it goes into the river and it still creates antimicrobial resistance, which is the problem. So in terms of the right drug, there is one point that is very important to mention, which is the critical important antibiotics, okay? So these are antibiotics that, like the one that we saw in the, in the slide before, is the, the antibiotics that work like a last resource 
for uh, and hum human infections because the problem is actually the humans that we cannot cure when the antibiotics don't work. So these are antibiotics that are in a list and that we should uh, keep apart and not use in, in animals at all because uh, in case we don't have any other antibiotic, we, we need to have them available and working for humans that are, for example, in an ICU and things like that. So this concept is, is very important and the list is constantly updated and we have to have it uh, all the times in our mind when we do treatments. And apart from the fact that we can reduce or we can make the, the, our use more prudent, there is a, a series of tools that unfortunately sometimes they are more expensive they take more time, they, they need more education of the farm staff and, and they need more effort, but they are there and we should use them in terms of reduction of, of antimicrobial use. So whenever we have infections uh, in our farms, even if we are using an antimicrobial at the same time, we should be looking for an, an alternative approach that we can use to, to sort the actual problem, not, not treat the infection, but treat the, the actual problem. Where is the infection coming from and all that? So there is several things that we can do, and, and there is a list here from a paper that asked uh, vets what they thought was the most important. And you have, for example, biosecurity, controlling the movement of animals, how they mix, how they move from farm to farm. Uh, that's the most important. Then the second one would be vaccination, which is also a, a, everybody has in mind, but, but vaccination can be improved in many farms. Single metals are not an option now because they are going to be banned. And then there is a series of, of other things that you can do, controlling the environment, better diagnostics, feed quality, etc. But at the end of the day, it comes to, to a very behavioral problem. We have to, to make people uh, conscious of this issue and start working because and they don't see the threat and so they don't act yet until it is uh, probably too late. So that's all from my side. The, the main thing that we have to keep in mind probably is that this is a, a problem that uh, affects humans, animals, and the environment. So it has to be tackled as such. Everybody has to play their, their role in the solution. Then uh, it's something that is a problem now. We are already late uh, and that's a, a social problem that people have to realize that this is there and, and we have to tackle it now. Uh, always use the, the rules, whatever guidelines you are using, the rules of prudent use for, for whenever you are thinking about using antimicrobials. And finally, look for all those tools that are out there, the biosecurity, vaccination, anything that you can look in your farms and with your animals to improve the use and to, to reduce the use and, and get a, a better final result. So that would be all from my side, Paul. Thank you very much, Edgar. Um, really excellent uh, presentation and a great overview of the topic. I suppose just looking at the international study where they ranked the different uh, feasibilities uh, in terms of, of controlling uh, antibiotic resistance, um, external biosecurity was ranked sixth. Would that be consistent with the case in, in Ireland? And maybe just while you're answering that, if Orla could be preparing her slides and, and sharing her screen. So just in, in terms of the external biosecurity being ranked sixth. Yeah. Uh... The, the thing is that the, when you when you talk about external biosecurity, uh, in, in general, the farms in Ireland, uh, especially the ones that, that use more antibiotics, the pig farms and poultry farms are very good. So they, they we know that they fail mostly in internal biosecurity. And it's the case in many in many other countries. That's probably why vets see that that's, that's the priority to, to act, the internal one and probably not the, the external. Okay, so because they're already very good at external biosecurity, then they, they rank the others higher. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Edgar. Um, I might hand over to, to Orla Keane. Orla is a research scientist on infection biology based at Chavis Grange, and Orla's focus is primarily on host pathogen interactions. Uh, Orla is going to look at reducing our antiparasitic resistance. So I'll hand over to you now, Orla. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so as Paul mentioned, so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to speak a little bit about antiparasitic resistance and the need to reduce antiparasitic resistance. So what I'll do is I'll briefly describe what antiparasitic resistance is and how it differs from antimicrobial resistance that Edgar has just been talking about. There are a lot of similarities, but there are a few important differences. I'll describe its impact, why it's important, and then some of the major factors that influence the development of antiparasitic resistance. Because of course, if we know what the factors are that influence, the influence its development, 
then we know where we can target interventions to slow the development of antiparasitic resistance. I'll give some information on the prevalence of antiparasitic resistance in gut worms of cattle and sheep in Ireland, and then describe what are the sustainable parasite control practices that we need to adopt to slow the further development of antiparasitic resistance. Okay, so grazing livestock are exposed to a large variety of different internal and external parasites. And in terms of the internal parasites, uh, which is what we're going to focus on today, the major parasites of concern are going to vary depending on the type of animal that you're talking about and the time of year. So generally for young stock, the two parasites that are initially of concern are coccidia and nematodirus. But immunity develops reasonably rapidly to these parasites within a matter of months. At this time of year and, and further on into the summer and into autumn, it's generally gut worms and lung worm that are the major parasites of concern. And animals develop reasonable immunity to these after their first grazing season, but it may take a second grazing season for, for good immunity to develop. And then as you head from autumn into winter, it's generally fluke, particularly liver fluke, that is the major parasite of concern. And immunity doesn't develop as readily to this parasite. So how we control these parasites is with the use of antiparasitic drugs. And antiparasitic resistance is the ability of parasites to survive doses of drugs that would normally kill parasites of the same species and the same stage. And much like antimicrobial resistance, what happens is, is that within any population of parasites, there will naturally be individuals that carry genetic changes that make them resistant to these, uh, to these antiparasitic drugs. And every time the population of parasites is exposed to the drug, the susceptible individuals are killed, the resistant uh, worms can go on and multiply, and so every time we treat, we place a selective pressure on for the development of resistance. And if we get to the point where the majority of the parasites in the population are resistant, then the drugs will no longer be effective against that population. So in terms of how it compares to antimicrobial resistance, well, there are a couple of important differences I'd like to highlight. And, and these are really around their impact on human health. So as Edgar has outlined there very nicely for us, antimicrobial resistance is a major public health challenge. And this is for a couple of reasons. So one reason is that some of the pathogens of livestock, bacteria like Salmonella, E. coli, Staph aureus, they can also infect humans. And so if a person picks up an infection from an animal and that bacteria is resistant to the antibiotics, then it may be difficult to treat that infection and that bacteria is a direct threat to their health. In contrast, most of the parasites that we're dealing with here, the parasites of livestock, they can't directly infect humans, so they're not a threat to our health. And secondly, is as Edgar mentioned before, bacteria can transfer genes, not just vertically from parent to offspring, but also horizontally from one bacteria to another. And this means that bacteria of animals that are carrying antibiotic resistance genes they can transfer those genes to human pathogens, again, uh, putting human health at risk. In contrast, parasites transmit genes much the same way that we do or cattle or sheep do. They transmit DNA from parent to offspring. So this means uh, livestock parasites that are resistant to the drugs we use to treat them, they can't transfer those genes to human parasites. So again, they're not such a risk to, to human health. So because they're not the same risk to human health as, as antimicrobial resistance is, they tend not to get the same attention, they tend not to get, get the same headlines. But they're a really significant risk to animal health, and particularly so in a country like Ireland, where we have a grass-based production system, and our animals are continually being exposed to these parasites, and we're very heavily reliant on these drugs to control these parasites. And if you look at expenditure on animal health products, in Ireland, the single um, group of products that there is the most expenditure on is antiparasitic products. And that just underlies um, uh, how reliant we are on these products to control these parasites. So it's really important that these products work for us. 
Now, anyone who's walked into a co-op may have seen a large number of products on the shelf, and you may think that there's a large number of products out there to control these parasites. But if we look at the antelminthic uh, products that are licensed for the control of worms, gut worms, lung worm, all of these products fall into a very small number of classes. So you've got the benzimidazoles, which are commonly known as the white wormers, levamazole, commonly known as the yellow wormers, and the macrocyclic lactones, commonly known as the clear wormers. Now, within the macrocyclic lactones, there's, there's two types. There's ivermectin type products and the moxidectin type products. So they are related, but there are some differences between them. And why this is important is because once a worm develops resistance to one product in a class, then generally all the products in the same class are affected. So if a worm develops resistance to one of the benzimidazoles, then all of the benzimidazoles cease to be effective. Now, there are two new products that have come onto the market more recently, the orange wormers and the purple wormers. These are available on veterinary prescription only, and they're only licensed for the control of worms in sheep, not in cattle. So the reality is we're very reliant on the first three classes to control worms. Now, what this table also shows is when these products were first released onto the market and when resistance was first reported globally, not in Ireland. And what you can see is that resistance was reported to these products fairly shortly after they were, they were uh, developed. And this is because parasites have a great propensity to develop resistance. And also because we've been using these products in a way that promotes the development of resistance. And it's that use that we need to, we need to look at. So what's the impact of antiparasitic resistance? Well, its impact will depend on its severity. So if you have a situation where the drugs are highly effective, so that means they kill 95% or more of the worms, this is when animal performance will be optimized. And as more and more of the worms become resistant, become resistant there will be a decrease in, in animal performance. However, what can happen is, is if you have a situation where let's say 80% of the worms are killed by a product, the farmer may see the benefit of using that product. They may see an improvement in performance after treatment, and they be may believe that product is effective. However, 20% of the worms have survived and are shedding resistant eggs out onto pasture. So it's very important that we diagnose resistance at early stages so we can put in place uh, steps to slow their further development. Because if you get to the situation where most of the worms or all of the worms are resistant, well, you really run out of road at that stage and it's very hard to slow the further development of resistance. Okay, in terms of what the prevalence of is of antiparasitic resistance on cattle and sheep farms in Ireland, well, this is some data where we recently calculated the weighted average prevalence of resistance, and this is based on all of the recently um, published studies. And what we found on this study was that on 56% of cattle farms that have been tested, there was evidence of resistance to the benzimidazoles or white wormers. On 16% of farms tested, there was evidence of resistance to the yellow wormers, to levamazole. On 100% of farms, so every farm that has been tested to date has shown evidence of resistance uh, to ivermectin. So ivermectin has not been fully effective. And on 73% of farms, there was evidence of resistance to moxidectin. Now, in a number of these cases, um, you know, resistance, uh, the, the products were killing quite a few of the worms, but not killing 95% or more. In terms of sheep farms, Again, resistance is quite widespread, although the profile for the different products is a little different. So on sheep farms, 70% of sheep farms tested have shown evidence of resistance to the benzimidazoles. 48% have shown evidence of resistance to levamazole. 50% have shown evidence of resistance to ivermectin. And 16% evidence of resistance to moxidectin. And what we've also uh, found on a small number of sheep farms are multi-drug resistant worms. So these are worms that are simultaneously resistant to 
the benzamidazoles, levamisole and ivermectin. And that leaves these farmers with quite a few options when it comes to the control of gut worms on their farms. So how does antiparasitic resistance develop? Well, it develops through any practice that gives the resistant worms a selective advantage over the resistant, over the susceptible worms. And four important factors that we know about are the initial resistance gene frequency. So what this means is really where you are on this graph. Are only a few of the worms resistant or are most of the worms resistant? And if only a few of the worms are resistant, you've much greater scope to slow the further development. Treatment frequency is another important factor. So every time we treat, the susceptible worms are killed and the resistant worms can continue to multiply. And so this gives them a selective advantage. Underdosing is another factor that can promote the development of resistance. And so this exposes the worms to a sublethal concentration of the drug. And the final factor, which is probably the single most important factor in the development of resistance, is refugia. And refugia is the proportion of the worm population not exposed to antiminthic treatment. And so if a population is not exposed, the resistant worms have no advantage. And there are two major sources of refugia on Irish farms. There's the worms on pasture, and there are worms in animals that are not treated. And so how refugia slows the development of resistance is if you have a situation where this represents the worm population in a herd with the susceptible worms in orange and the resistant worms in gray. If you treat that entire herd with an antiminthic, only the resistant worms survive and shed eggs out onto pasture. If, for example, they were dosed and moved to clean pasture like reseeded ground or silage aftermath, those resistant worms will be diluted by very few susceptible worms. So in this population of worms now, the majority carry the genes for resistance. And as that population cycles, resistance will develop rapidly. If you contrast that with a situation where you've good refugia, so again, in this instance, uh, animals are treated and the resistant worms survive and shed eggs out onto pasture. But in this case, they're diluted by a large number of susceptible worms. So these could be worms on pasture by, by turning the animals out to contaminated pasture after treatment, or they could be worms from animals that are not treated. This population, the majority of worms now carry the genes for susceptibility and the population remains overall susceptible and resistance develops more slowly. Okay, so in terms of slowing the development of antiparasitic resistance, much as Edgar outlined for antimicrobial resistance, it's about doing things right. So using the right product. So that means it's effective against the target parasite. So if you're targeting worms, you're using a wormer. If you're targeting fluke, you're using a flucicide. Generally, these parasites are problems at, are at different times of the year. So it's, you know, it's not too often that you need to target both. And you should only be using a combination worm or flucicide if you know you need to target both parasites. The other thing about choosing a right product is you need to use a product that is effective on your farm. You need to treat the right animal at the right time. So older animals often have immunity and, and may not require treatment. For younger susceptible stock that may require treatment, um, then it's about getting the timing of that treatment right when the worm burden is sufficient to justify treatment. So this makes sure that the treatment is, is justified, so you're only using as much as is necessary, and it helps maintain refugia. And you want to give the right dose rate administered in the right way, and this prevents underdosing. Okay, so in summary, antiparasitic drugs are finite. There's only a small number of classes available to us, and they're really precious. They're valuable. We're highly reliant on them. We need them to work when we need them. Antiparasitic resistance is already reasonably widespread in gut worms um, in Ireland, and that's gut worms of both cattle and sheep. And so we need to use these antiparasitic drugs in a sustainable manner to slow the further development of resistance and to ensure they continue to work into the future. Maintaining refugia is a way of slowing the further development of resistance. So that's things like not dosing and moving to clean pasture, and leaving older animals that have immunity not treated, so they're a source of refugia. And it's about doing things right, 
treating the right animal with the right product in the right way at the right time. Okay, so with that, I'll hand you back to Paul. Thank you, Orla. Um, really another excellent presentation. Um, some, I suppose some worrying data there as well, Orla, in terms of the, the degree of resistance on farms. Um, I suppose you, the slide we showed 100% of cattle farms showed some level of resistance. Presumably that, that doesn't mean that the, the um, it's the ivermectin product you were referring to, that they're not, they're not entirely ineffective, that they have some level of effectiveness. So do you want to comment a little bit on that? Yeah, so, so I suppose that depended very much on the farm. So of all the farms tested, there was only two where the product completely failed. It, it, it completely failed to kill any worms whatsoever. So there was no decrease in the fecal egg count after treatment. For the rest of the farms, there was some decrease after treatment. So there was some benefit of using the product. So they have some scope to slow the development, but it's important they take steps now to slow the further development because okay. you don't want to get to that situation where the product is completely ineffective. Okay, good. Thank you, Orla. Thanks, Orla, for that. Um, and just a reminder to please keep your question and answers coming in uh, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the final presentation. Uh, this is Neve Field. Uh, Neve is a research scientist on herd health and is based at the Chagas Moorpark research site. Uh, and Neve researches on dairy herd health uh, and infectious disease. And Neve is going to look at clinical aspects of antimicrobial resistance. So Neve. Thank you, Paul, um, for that introduction. Um, yeah, my name's Neve Field. Um, I'm going to cover some case studies that just demonstrate some farms that have successfully managed to reduce their use of antibiotics or um, antiparasitics. Um, so getting straight into it, I'm just going to start off with this slide going through the different reasons um, that we use antibiotics and antiparasitics on farm. So there's three different ways or reasons we would use these drugs. So uh, therapeutic, metaphylactic and prophylactic. So an example of therapeutic use would be a cow um, suffering with mastitis infection. So um, showing, showing clinical signs and you decide that she needs um, antibiotics uh, to treat the infection. So you, you treat her with the antibiotics and hopefully you end up with a healthy cow at the end. And so that's an example of therapeutic use. Metaphylactic use then is a little bit different. So an example of this would be in the case of a pneumonia outbreak. Um, where you have um, an animal showing clinical signs of pneumonia, maybe coughing and a high temperature, um, and you need to treat that animal with antibiotics in the first instance, but you also realise that that animal is in very close contact with other health, seemingly healthy animals in a pen, and that they are at high risk of developing infection from this animal. So you decide to treat the whole pen. So that's an example of metaphylactically treating those healthy animals to prevent infection. And then finally, prophylactic use of antibiotics. An example of this would be the use of blanket dry cow antibiotics um, to prevent um, infections during the dry period. Um, so in most instances, when you're using these antibiotics, you're giving them to healthy cows that have shown no evidence um, or signs of infection, but it's with the intention of preventing future infections occurring. Um, so this is an example of prophylactic use and we'll be, going, we'll be seeing these more um, in the case studies. So the first uh, case study I have for you is an example of a farm that reduced their antibiotic use. So this is a sheep flock um, managed by Chagask, um, and this flock was having a problem with lameness in, in the sheep. So it was mainly in lameness of infectious causes, uh, mainly scald and foot rot. So they had a lot of lame sheep uh, causing reduced productivity in the flock and they were using a lot of antibiotics to treat the infections. So this is an example of a therapeutic use of antibiotics, um, but at a very high level. So they set about, rather than trying to just continually treat the problem with, with antibiotics as it occurred, they, they decided to take a more preventative, proactive approach um, and improve their infection control in the flock. So the first step um, in, in this was developing a flock health plan with the help of their vet um, and advisor uh, for the flock. So um, getting to the root cause of the problem with um, various investigations of their records, 
uh, treatment records and, and developing a plan of action as, as to how they could prevent the spread of this infectious lameness. Uh, one of the major things um, they did was they installed a new batch foot bath, um, which was a high initial investment, but it definitely paid off. So you can see in the picture here an example of a batch foot bath. Um, and the beauty of this is that the solution that the sheep are treated with, that they stand in to treat uh, their feet, is uh, there's no antibiotics in it. It's typically either zinc sulfate or formalin which can help to treat infections and also prevent uh, the spread of infections to healthy, healthy sheep. Um, so they, they usually have to stand in for a minimum contact time of five or six minutes. And this um, replaced some temporary uh, portable foot baths that this flock was using and um, that were proving to be not very practical. Um, so then the outcome of this was very successful in this, in this flock. So between 2015 and 2019, they managed to uh, greatly reduce their use of antibiotics. Um, as you can see in the table here, they went from 33 bottles of a long acting alamycin product right down to only four. Um, the same with pen strep went down to pretty much zero. Um, they were still using a little bit of an antibiotic spray, but um, almost halved the use of that. And it also had a major impact on the costs they were, uh, the, the money they were spending on these treatments. Um, and also of, of massive value was that it greatly increased the productivity of the flock. They were having a lot less um, incidence of lameness. Um, and so the, the productivity and weight gain of the, of the flock was increased. So it was a, a great success. So on to case study two, um, this is an example of reducing antiparasitic use in a dairy herd. So in this example, this farmer was using blanket worm dosing in his calves and heifers. So in his young stock, um, he was dosing them throughout the grazing season um, at regular intervals, even though they had, he had no evidence of high worm burdens clinically in the, in the herd. So there was no evidence that they were having problems with weight gain or, or evidence of scour. And he decided that um, he wanted to see, could he take a more selective approach um, to dosing his young stock? Uh, this was just the traditional way that it had always been done in the herd, but he, he realized that um, he possibly didn't need to be treating um, his animals this frequently. So what he did to set about reducing his use of antiparasitics, um, well, he started regularly monitoring worm egg counts by taking pooled fecal samples from his calves and heifers um, at different intervals through the grazing season. Very cheap to get this test in the lab. You get a worm egg count um, and if, if it's zero, then great. Um, and if it's a high worm egg burden, uh, the, the recommendation then would be to treat. Um, he was also taking weights uh, using a simple weigh tape um, to monitor average daily gain in the calves. He wasn't weighing every single one of them, but just keeping an eye on it. And also, as you can see in the picture in the bottom left, he was regularly going out to check them um, and he was keeping a keen eye out for, for signs of worm burden, such as the, the health of their coats. Were they nice and shiny? Uh, were they thriving? And did they have any evidence of worm burden, such as um, you know, loose feces or, or scour? And um, so all of these things together throughout the grazing season, he, he realized that he didn't have um, high worm burdens at all, uh, particularly in his second season grazers. So the heifers um, showed no um, worm evidence of a worm burden in their weights or in their worm egg counts. And he was able to completely uh, reduce his amount of dosing in, in that age group. And the, similarly in the calves, he greatly reduced the frequency he was needing to dose them. So this is just the outcome of that in this table. Um, so in terms of the ivermectin poron in the first line, this is what he was mainly using in his um, older heifers. Um, so he completely cut that out altogether, which is brilliant. Um, as Orla showed in her presentation, there's a high incidence of resistance uh, developing to ivermectin doses. So the fact that he was able to reduce this altogether in his um, heifers was, was great. Um, he just gave them a, a dose of albendazole um, in the winter uh, coming into housing to clear out any uh, worm and fluke burdens in them. He continued giving the young calves ivermectin injectable, but uh, much less frequently and they got none of it um, early in the grazing season when worm burdens are typically low. They, got, um, they, did, they did show signs of having um, building up worm burdens in the second half of the grazing season. So they did get some ivermectin then, but it was based on evidence. Um, as you can see that the costs um, when it comes to dosing animals aren't high. So that isn't the main incentive for farmers to reduce their use of antiparasitics. 
but definitely, as Orla said, the importance of needing these products in the future um, should be um, incentive enough to, to try and reduce the use of them. Okay, so just moving on to the third and final case study I have, another example of reducing antibiotic use on farm. Um, so in this case, we're looking at a large dairy farm that was operating a split calving season, so calving in spring and autumn. And in this farm, um, he was using blanket use of intramammary antibiotics at dry off of his cows at the end of lactation to prevent new infections developing during the dry period. So this was always the traditional way of doing things in Ireland, in Irish dairy herds. Um, at, when you dried off the cows, all of them just got um, an intramammary antibiotic that would last long lasting uh, throughout the dry period to prevent new infections developing. Um, but in recent years, with the more awareness of um, the, uh, the risks of antimicrobial resistance developing, there has been a move to using more selective uh, therapies, um, picking out your cows most at risk of infection and only treating them. So this farmer decided he would, um, he would try to take this on a few years ago. So he set about making the switch from blanket uh, treating all his cows to selective dry cow therapy with antibiotics. So how did he do this? Well, the main thing he, he initially started uh, routinely monitoring um, the, his mastitis control using milk recording. Um, so he's getting individual milk samples taken from all the lactating cows regularly throughout uh, their lactation. And this shows um, up any evidence of inflammation or infection in the udder and you can use it to gauge um, the success of your, of your mastitis control in the herd. He also engaged with CellCheck, which is a program um, managed by Animal Health Ireland with lots of industry support that provide excellent guidelines for mastitis control on farm um, and support farmers through vets and, and advisors on how to reduce um, um, infections in, in, the, in the herd. So this is an example here in this picture on the left of um, the data that farmers can see from their milk recording with cows that are showing evidence of high inflammation in the udder appearing in amber. So it just gives you a great um, power knowledge to um, identify which cows you can use this selective uh, dry cow therapy, which cows you need to use an antibiotic in, sorry, and which cows um, you don't, they're low risk and they, they don't need an antibiotic at dry off. So he was very successful um, over the years with this program. So as you can see from the table here, um, in 2015, he had 300 cows total in the herd um, and all, all of them were getting an antibiotic at dry off. Um, and in 2020, then uh, this farmer had increased his herd to 500 cows, so um, quite a lot more animals, but he had only 45 cows getting an antibiotic at dry off, which is a huge reduction. So then you can see there that was 100% of cows in 2015 and only 8% in 2020 getting antibiotic. Um, and on the bottom line, this average somatic cell count, that's um, one of the most important indicators of inflammation or a measure of um, inf evidence of mastitis in the herd subclinically. And in 2015, this was at 135. And in 2020, it had only increased slightly to 155, which demonstrates still effective um, control of mastitis in this herd. Um, so this was uh, another example of how with, with the right data and gathering evidence and um, using routine monitoring of, of infection levels in the herd that you can effectively reduce your um, antimicrobial use. So in summary, um, I guess to sum up um, my slides there, um, the overarching theme is to try when it comes to antibiotics and antiparasitics to use as little as possible, but as much as necessary. Um, and definitely prevention is better than cure when it comes to um, treating infection. So we should try and gather data and evidence um, and use this to build a preventative plan rather than just using antibiotics and antiparasitics to uh, fix the problem. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niamh. Uh, another fantastic presentation, and I suppose more in terms of, you know, finding solutions and finding alternatives to, to antimicrobial and antiparasitic use on farms. Um, can I ask Edgar and Orla, please, to, to um, turn on their cameras uh, and unmute their mics? And just while they're doing that, uh, Niamh, um, really interesting, the final case study uh, in terms of the, you know, the use of selective drug therapy. 
And one of the things that I noticed was that the farmer who, who implemented that had a frequency, a number of years of, uh, of milk recording, uh, was doing it quite frequently. So, you know, what is the what, what are the guidelines or, or the recommendations in terms of how long you need to be milk recording for and the, the level of frequency uh, to be able to make a decision on selective dry cow therapy? Well, um, in general, in terms of um, select, engaging in selective dry cow therapy, you do have to be milk recording. Um, and ideally, it would be minimum of, of four times a year. I would think that you would need um, to milk record your herd and uh, to gather adequate evidence of uh, to back up which cows are at risk of infection and which cows are not at risk. Um, and it's just having that data um, to, back, to, to have confidence that you aren't going to end up um, with a, a higher um, amount of new infections developing in the dry period. Um, it, it will take a number of years uh, to get a, a long number of years to certainly make as much of an impact as this farmer did. But um, you can start off straight away, you know, with milk recording with the help of your vet. And it may be that you might only do 5% of the herd um, with, so, with not getting an antibiotic in year one and gradually build that up as you build confidence um, in the system and consistently get, keeping together, gathering that data. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll open the floor then to, um, to, the, to the full panel. Um, just going to one of the questions here, um, I suppose it's more of a comment, Edgar, more so than, than a question uh, in terms of uh, the presentation of ways to reduce antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the comment is that the most important aid to deal with this problem is to understand the nature and health of the immune system, both animal uh, and human, and to support this through diet controls, which are currently not researched properly, and immunosuppressive elements are incorporated into the accepted uh, agricultural methods, inadvertently exposing our food chain to deleterious effects of immunosuppression. So I, I suppose a, a long comment, but any, any response to that, uh, Edgar? Yes, well, it's, it's more like four or five comments than, than one. But yes, well, anything that we do in an animal or, or in a human to improve health, it's, it's basically a failure of, of our own immune system because the one that is best suited to solve a problem is our immune system, that's a fact. So yes, if we improve the immune system, obviously it's, it's the best way to, or we keep it healthy, it's, it's the best way to do it. Uh, the comment about the diet, uh, I wouldn't agree. I mean, it's a, it, there is no one single uh, factor. There's many factors that are, that are there and, and all of them are hugely important. So it's, it's something that is there. And in terms of the of the lack of research that is mentioned, there is always a lack of research. That's why we do science and we keep going, keep going, keep going. But at some point you have to do things. So I think we have enough evidence now that there's a problem and we have enough information to, to start acting. So, and the, the important thing here is that if you say the problem is the immune system and this and that, yes. But when you go into the farm, you have to convince the farmer and you have to make an impact in the farm. So that, and, and we have overlooked this for a long time. The most effective thing is not to have the best knowledge or whatever, is to have the best way to reach the farmer, explain the farmer, and that the farmer makes the change and the farm staff makes the change. Because you can have the best information in the world, but if you don't transfer it to the farmer and give the tools to the farmer or the, or the doctor, if we are talking about the human medicine as the doctor. So if we don't have that, that's the best, the best approach. And that's why for me, by security and all those are, are areas that we have to improve, but at the moment, we, we probably need to, to work on that social element. Okay, okay, it's about behavior as much as anything at this stage then. Um, or a couple of questions here uh, coming your way, I suppose. Uh, any indication on the percentage of fecal egg count and fecal egg count reduction tests by farmers? Is it, is it static or rising? And I suppose a second question there, a drenching of uh, at lambing for periparturient uh, uh, yolks. Some vets are saying to dogs all, some hoggets, some tin yolks, and so on. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so I suppose I'll answer the first one uh, first. Yeah, there, there's there's no doubt about it. There is not enough testing going on. You know, um, the the all of that data that was presented there on, on resistance, that's generally work that's been carried out by Chagas or, or the department. And I think there's probably not enough testing that's going on, the, on, going on on the ground. And I would get the impression it's it's static unless um, when you had a program like the Sheep Technology Adoption Program, 
there was a take up for a while when it was part of that program, but then it dropped off again when that program finished. So mm. um, my impression is at the moment is that it's, it's relatively static. It can increase when there is a, a scheme, um, but there's not enough of it. Um, the question about periparturian rise, you know, that's, that's a really great question. And, and it's well known that there's a relaxation of immunity in yos around parturition and that there will be a rise in fecal egg count. And in the past, it was advocated to treat them and that this prevented them shedding eggs out onto pasture and reduced pasture contamination. Now, in light of anthelminthic resistance, I, I have two concerns with that. The first one is, if you think what will happen if you dose your yos with a product that is not fully effective, those yos will then be shedding out resistant eggs and all resistant eggs at a time when pasture contamination is low. So it's a really high risk strategy for the development of resistance from that regard, in that regard. The second thing is the, the idea around treating for the periparturient rise was to reduce pasture contamination. But in order for it to make, to, to, to benefit from that reduced pasture contamination, you need to reduce the number of doses given to the lambs. And you need to know when to dose the lambs by doing fecal egg counts and people weren't doing, doing that. So in my view, uh, the best strategy is to use your yos as a source of refugia and not to treat them. Now that said, if you do have lactating yearling yos, or if you do have a few thin yos that you think might benefit from treatment, you know, that that wouldn't be a problem. But at that point, you're targeting individuals that need it rather than the whole flock. So I wouldn't be treating the whole flock unless there is, it's demonstrated that they need that treatment. I wouldn't be treating the yolk flock. Okay, and just when you mentioned the concept of refugia there, uh, Orla, one of the examples of poor refugia that you gave was moving to clean pasture. So uh, is that the standard recommendation now that you dose and you move to, uh, let's call it a dirty pasture or a pasture that has some exposure on it already? Yeah. Is that the yeah. recommendation now? Yes. So, so dosing and moving to clean pasture, and again, I know it has been advocated in the past, but it does select for resistance. So the um, advice now would be to dose and move to contaminated pasture. Now, the reality is in most pasture, in most farms in Ireland, there's a fairly limited amount of clean pasture. Um, it's quite hard to get clean pasture, but um, dose and move to contaminated pasture. Otherwise, you, you, you are placing a selection pressure for resistance. Okay, a question for Neve. Uh, Neve, any data on antibiotic resistance on farms before and after reducing antibiotic use? Um, in these particular studies, no. Um, uh, these particular case studies, there, there wasn't evidence of antibiotic resistance. And I don't know myself of any um, farms I've come across um, in practice that have um, a documented problem with antibiotic resistance. Individual animals with particular infections where you test, you know, you do a culture and sensitivity and they show up an infection that is resistant to various antibiotics, but there usually is one that you can, one antibiotic you can use. But no, it's not a problem we come across frequently in, on farm with an actual, where the farm has an antibiotic resistance problem. But definitely that's, um, that's not where the focus should be when it comes to trying to reduce your antibiotic use. Um, you're doing it for, as Edgar demonstrated in his presentation, um, human health, you know, and the, the longevity of these drugs in, into the future, um, their efficacy. And also by default, as we've seen in these farms, um, in the case studies, that in a lot of cases where they manage to reduce their use of antibiotics and antiparasitics, they're also in improving herd health and um, reducing their costs um, in terms of just reactively treating disease. They're getting to the root of the problem um, rather than just using antibiotics as a, as a crutch. Okay, I, I, might, I might ask you a, just a follow-on question to that, Niamh. Uh, and Edgar, you might comment on this as well, please. Um, how can we get our vets to promote antimicrobial resistance and the correct use of antibiotics on our farms? So what do we need to do to, you know, to, to drive behavioural change, both at farm level, I suppose, at the, the veterinary industry level as well, in terms of promoting uh, antimicrobial resistance? From, from the vet's point of view, um, it definitely, the, the traditional model of, of veterinary practice um, in farm animal practice in Ireland um, is, was definitely one of you know problem solving so getting called out to a sick animal and and just treating it um, for that problem often with using antibiotics 
Um, but there definitely is a shift, I, I believe, um, starting um, in, in recent years with uh, more of an emphasis on herd health planning, flock health planning, trying to take a more preventative approach. And it is driven by demand from farmers too um, for these services um, and, and vets. There's, there's a new, um, new course in UCD, a postgraduate certificate for vets that's all about herd health uh, planning and preventative um, management. Um, so there is an education element when it comes to, to vets and also the, the drive, the demand for it from the farmers um, who are using their service. Okay, Edgar, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, well, from uh, we are always ahead with the, with the pigs and also with the poultry because the, the problem is bigger there. So we, we have experience with that. In the last five years, we have been working with the farmers and I think at this stage, the vets, at least in the pig side, are, are convinced that that's, that's what has to happen. And they are working very hard for that to reduce the antimicrobials, especially because next year there is a, a new law, a new European legislation that is going to ban half of the, of the use of antimicrobials, of the applications. Uh, and in terms of, of uh, promoting this, not only with the vets, with the farmers and with everybody, uh, with like talk to the farmers that we have worked already on, on this, they will tell you. I mean, it takes time, it takes money, but after two years, your farm is gonna be better than than any time before. Better than new, probably, so. Definitely the new legislation next year will will be a key behavioral change driver there, we would we would expect. Um, we are running just uh, towards the end of our of our webinar, so I have one quick question maybe for Orla. Um, I've heard that there was only very limited, if any, evidence of antimicrobial resistance in cattle. What is the current scientific wisdom on this? So what is our data telling us in terms of antimicrobial resistance in cattle? So in terms of the, the gut worms, um, there, there was until relatively recently, up until maybe um, two or years ago, there had been very little testing done. The amount of testing that has still been done is, is relatively low. You're talking about you know, um, no more than I think there's probably about 21 farms that were done for ivermectin resistance. So, you know, it is relatively small numbers. We definitely need more testing, but a lot more has been done in the last couple of years. So in terms of that comment, if they'd heard that previously, that might have been true in the past, but we certainly know more about it now. And certainly the, 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 some of the graphs you presented would, would be concerning in that regard as well. Yeah. Okay, so look, this brings us to the end of this edition of, of Research Insights. I want to thank all the presenters and I want to thank all of you who have joined us and attended this morning. Um, a fantastic overview of work uh, in the area of antimintic and, and antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial resistance. It's a critical issue, so it's, it's really important that we have uh, a, a, a strong research program uh, in this area. Uh, so it's great to hear that from, from Edgar, Orla and from Neve. Um, our next Research Insights webinar is in two weeks' time on the 23rd of June, uh, and our focus is on milk quality. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and goodbye.